the interactive session. So in the last live session, we started discussion discussing about strengthening of existing infrastructure, which can be done either by replacing the old uh, deteriorated concrete by high strength material uh, or by attaching new members or materials over existing surface and or by redistributing stresses on the existing members. For completing these activities, we talked uh, about five basic uh, retrofitting techniques that were section enlargement, composite construction, post tensioning, stress reduction and grouting. Now for different concrete members, we discussed different ways to repair. For beams and girders, based on the need for either shear or flexural strengthening, we discussed techniques like internal and external post tensioning, providing additional steel reinforcement, section enlargement uh, and concrete overlay uh, and uh, externally bounded plate, steel plates uh, near surface mount mounting and span shortening. So these are different ways that we discussed for retrofitting of beams and girders. For uh, columns, we talked uh, ways for axial strengthening through section enlargement, for ductility, ductility strengthening through RC jacketing, for shear and moment strengthening through the use of shear collars, shear plates and shear walls. For foundation, we talked about section enlargement, underpinning in which we talked about pit method, pile method and chemical method. And uh, for walls, we talked about concrete overlay, steel jacketing and for slabs, we talked about slab jacking. So after discussing each component and its uh, strengthening technique, we started discussing on composites in which we saw different types of composite and then we went deep into fiber reinforced polymer composite, the properties of different fibers, different matrix. We saw different applications of fiber reinforced polymer composites and how from lamina to laminate we reach FRPC. Here we discussed how orientation of fiber dictates the property of laminates and then through micro mechanics we established the understanding uh, of elastic properties of composite based on the property and relative proportions of fibers and composites. So this was all from last week. Now we ended the, the last session solving uh, equations to calculate elastic properties of composite if properties of fibers and uh, matrix is known. So just to summarize those formula in a brief way, this table shows all the key relations. Now the question here comes how to remember the relations. So there is just one rule to remember mostly and that is rule of mixture. So rule of mixture is nothing but summation of product of volume fraction times property of individual component. Okay. Suppose you know the fraction of fiber and matrix. Okay. The relative proportion of fiber and matrix you know and you know the properties of fiber and matrix. So your density follows the rule of mixture. Your in longitudinal loading, the stress follows the rule of mixture and the modulus of elasticity also follows the rule of mixture. Under transverse loading, uh, strain follows the rule of mixture. Under uh, in plane shearing, uh, uh, the shear strain follows the rule of mixture and in poisons ratio estimation, major poisons ratio follow the rule of mixture. So if we remember just what is rule of mixture, then most of the formula will be clear to us and just few remaining relationships would be needed to be remembered. Okay, I hope these are clear to everyone now. Now, as it was asked last week, let's see few numericals now which will clear, clarify the assignment problems also and it will help you, it will expose you to a, a little difficult level of numericals also. Okay, so this is the first question. So the question says, a composite material consists of 60% by weight of last fiber whose properties are given modulus of elasticity and density and 40% by weight of epoxy resin whose properties are given modulus of elasticity and density. 
calculate the effective Young's modulus of the composite and calculate compute the ratio of load shared by fiber and composite when it is loaded in longitudinal direction. Okay, so I will wait for a couple of minutes, try to solve the question and or try to think how you can solve this question and then we'll see the solution step by step. Okay, uh, till that time if anyone has any doubt regarding any content we discussed in last week, you can post your query in the chat box. And this screen I will freeze for you guys, just see the question. Okay, let's see the solution now. Okay, so the first step is to write whatever thing is given in the question. So step one, given. So what all things are given to us? Uh, we know the weight fraction of fiber WF is 0. 0.6 and weight fraction of matrix is 0. 0.4. Then we know the Young's modulus of fiber, it is 72 GPA and Young's modulus of matrix epoxy resin, it is 3 GPA. Apart from this, we know density of fiber, okay. So rho f is 2.58 gram per centimeter cube and rho m is 1.25 gram per centimeter cube. Okay, so these all things are given to us. Now my step 2 will be calculate Young modulus of composite. Okay, so we know Young's modulus of composite follows rule of mixture. So we can write PC is equal to Young's modulus of fiber times volume fraction of fiber plus Young's modulus of matrix times volume fraction of matrix okay but we don't know the volume fraction okay 
we know the weight fraction we don't know the volume fraction so first we need to calculate the volume fraction now how it can be done so we know density of composite can be written in terms of weight fraction also like this okay so we can write okay in terms of weight fraction we can write density of composite like this uh, 1 upon rho c is equal to wf upon rho f plus wm upon rho m so this is nothing but wf is 0 0.6 upon 2.58 plus 0.4 divided by 1.25 okay upon solving you will get rho c is equal to 1.81 gram per centimeter cube okay now when we know the density of composite we can calculate the volume fraction of fiber by a simple relationship that we saw in the last class volume fraction of fiber is related to weight fraction of fiber by the formula volume fraction is equal to weight fraction into density of composite upon density of fiber okay so right now we know all the values in the lhs in the rhs so we can compute lhs like this so weight fraction is 0 0.6 times density of composite 1.81 that we calculated just now and density of fiber we know 2.58 okay so this will give me a volume fraction of fiber as 0. 4.2 and thus volume fraction of compo matrix will become 1 minus 0.42 that is nothing but 0.58 now we know the volume fraction of fiber and volume fraction of matrix so now we can simply compute the Young's modulus of composite uh, by put, substituting value here, so EF is 72 times volume fraction of my, uh, fiber 0. 0.42 plus uh, Young's modulus of matrix is 3 times volume fraction of uh, matrix is 0. 0.58. So upon solving, you will get a value of 31.98 gigapascal. Okay, so this is the solution for our first part of the question so here the important thing was you need to remember the rule of mixture okay and you need to remember how you can convert weight fraction into volume fraction okay so if you remember this formula you just need to remember this one this relation and this relation and then you can solve any any type of problem okay now the second part of the question was also compute the ratio of load shared by fiber and composite so this will be nothing but so step 3 load taken by fiber so how we can calculate so suppose pf is the load taken by fiber and pc is the total load acting on the composite so pf by pc is given by nothing but uh, we can write this as ef times vf upon ef times vf plus em times pm so here ef is my young's modulus of fiber times volume fraction of fiber upon Young's modulus of fiber times volume fraction of fiber plus Young's modulus of matrix times volume fraction of matrix. So we saw this derivation in the last class also. So what we do basically uh, the load taken by fiber is nothing but the stress acting on fiber times the area of fiber and total load taken by composite is nothing but the stress acting on fiber times the area to area of fiber plus stress acting on matrix times the area of matrix. Now we know stress can be written as Young's modulus into strain and since strain will be same in all fiber composite and matrix it will cancel out and the proportion of area will be the same as the volume proportion because the length 
of the composite in total is the same okay so finally you will reach to this uh, relationship so we know uh, young's modulus of fiber and matrix and we know volume fraction so substituting all the values so it will be 72 times 0.42 upon 72 times 0.42 plus 3 times 0.58 so on solving this you will get the load taken by fiber will be 0.945 times the total load okay so this much fraction of total load is taken by the fiber and 1 minus 0.945 will be the load taken by the matrix okay i hope this uh, question is clear to everyone any doubts in this question anyone has any doubt okay so just uh, one thing you need to remember is the rule of mixture and then everything will be clear to you okay so let's see one more uh, numerical now, a different one now. Okay. So what this question says, a composite material consists of 75% by volume of aramid fibers whose Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio is given to us and 25% by volume of uh, aluminum matrix whose Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio is given. Okay. Calculate the shear modulus an effective Poisson's ratio of composite both major and minor okay so I will again uh, like mute myself for a couple of minutes try to think the relationships that will be used here try to think how rule of mixture will be applied here and what all things we know what all things are missing and then we'll see the solution Okay, uh, let's see the solution now.
so again uh, first of all let's write what all things are given to us in the question the so step one will be given so given values are we know the volume fraction of fiber is 0.75 and the volume fraction of uh, matrix is 0.25 Okay, we know the Young's modulus of fiber is 100 GPA. And Young's modulus of matrix is 70 GPA. And apart from this, we know Poisson's ratio of fiber. Okay is 0.2 and Poisson's ratio of matrix is 0.35 okay so these are values are known to us now my step 2 will be calculating the shear modulus of composite that is represented by GC okay so we saw in this table so under end plane shearing my shear strain follows the rule of mixture and my shear modulus follows the recipro reciprocal law we can say so just copy this I am just copying this formula from here okay so my 1 upon GC is equal to volume fraction of fiber upon shear modulus of fiber plus volume fraction of uh, matrix upon shear modulus of matrix but right now we don't know shear modulus of fiber or matrix okay that is that is what we don't know but we know the Young's modulus and we know the Poisson's ratio so there is one relationship that additionally you can remember so shear modulus is related to Young's modulus by this relationship okay let me just write it first okay so shear modulus is equal to uh, Young's modulus upon 2 times 1 plus Poisson's ratio of fiber okay this relationship you can remember because it will be very useful for you ahead also in your exam maybe in exam if you get directly the uh, modulus of elasticity and some question is asked about shear modulus then you need to remember this formula okay so using this formula we can calculate the shear modulus of fiber now very easily so it will be nothing but 100 upon 2 times 1 plus Poisson's ratio is 0.2 okay so upon solving this we will get 41.67 GPA is my shear modulus of fiber and similarly for matrix again we will write this equation okay so gm will be em upon 1 plus uh, modulus uh, like poison ratio of matrix time, times 2 so this will now become 70 divided by 2 times 1 plus 0.35 and this will come out to be 25.93 GPA okay now we know the shear modulus of fiber we know the shear modulus of matrix and we know the volume proportions now directly okay so we can calculate the uh, shear modulus of composite very easily so it will be 0 0.75 upon 41.67 plus 0 0.25 divided by 25.93 so upon solving you will get GC is equal to 36.81 GPA okay so this is the solution of part 1 
okay i hope this part is clear to everyone now step 3 is to calculate poisson's ratio of composite so we know here rule of mixture is followed by major poisson's ratio okay and what is that rule of mixture so we can write simply poisson's ratio of composite is equal to poisson's ratio of fiber times volume fraction of fiber plus poisson's ratio of matrix times volume fraction of matrix so we know both the values so it will be nothing but 0 0.75 times 0 0.2 0 0.2 times 0 0.75 plus 0 0.35 times 0 0.25 so this will give us the value 0 0.2375 so this will be our major poisons ratio okay and then minor poisson's ratio so we saw a direct relationship how to calculate minor poisson's ratio from major so minor poisson's ratio vct and this is vcl okay so we uh, new ct is given by uh, Modulus uh, Young's modulus in transverse direction upon Young's modulus in longitudinal direction times Poisson's ratio in a major spo major Poisson's ratio. Now we need to calculate both Young's modulus in the transverse direction for composite and Young's modulus in longitudinal direction for composite. So in longitudinal direction, Young's modulus follows the rule of mixture EF times VF plus em times vm we saw in the last question also so right now values are directly known to us so just input the values 70 times 0.25 so this will come out to be 92.5 gpa so this is my young's modulus of composite in longitudinal direction and in transverse direction it follows the inverse uh, inverse equality Okay, so from here I will copy the formula. In transverse direction, Young's modulus is given by this relationship that we saw in the last lecture also. In the table also we have summarized. So it will be 0.75 upon 100 plus 0.25 divided by 70. And this will give me my ECT value as... 90.32 GPA. Okay, now we know ECT and ECL both, so we can calculate the minus Poisson's ratio from this relationship very easily. So just substituting all the values, we'll get minor minor Poisson's ratio as ECT 90.32 divided by ECL 92.5 times. Uh, poison's ratio in major direction so it is uh, major poison's ratio so 0.2375 that we calculated so it will come out to be 0.232 so this is my minor poison's ratio and this was my major poison's ratio okay i hope both the questions are clear to everyone now so basically through these two questions i have tried to cover all the relationships that we talked in the last session and in this table okay so you can see we covered this relationship this relation for density we covered both for longitudinal loading we covered both the relationships in transverse loading we talked about how to calculate uh, modulus of elasticity in transverse direction for in plane shear we covered this relationship and in Poisson's ratio, we covered both the relationship, major and minor Poisson's ratio. 
any doubt in these two questions everyone clear what is the basic step to remember the rule of mixture okay if there are no doubts we'll move ahead then okay so if you will just like if if you still ha still have any doubt in these two question try to solve on on your own just remember this table it will clarify everything to you and try to solve these two questions on your own if you are able to under understand these two question any question that will be coming in your nptel exam also or anywhere when you talk about the properties estimating properties of composite it will be easy for you now okay i see there are no doubts so we'll move ahead okay so until now we discussed what is composite different types of composite then we talked about frpc types of fibers and polymers and how fiber orientation and fire fractional proportion dictates the composite properties now let's see how composite are actually manufactured so manufacturing of frp composite involves manufacturing of fiber preforms and then reinforce reinforcing these fibers with the matrix material by various techniques okay now what do we mean by fiber preform here so fiber preforms involves weaving knitting braiding and stitching of fibers in a long sheet or mat structure so this is nothing but a lamina okay so the first basic unit of a uh, laminate of an or an frp composite is the lamina so the fiber preform is this lamina where fibers are arranged in a particular direction okay so that is known as fiber preform the a long sheet or mat structure of fiber okay now uh, what do we mean by various techniques in which these fiber preforms are loaded with matrix so uh, when we talk about these very various techniques the techniques are basically classified into three types these three types are contact molding compression molding and filament winding in com contact molding there is two technique hand lay up and spray up technique in compression molding there are four sub categories match die molding forming method employing gas pressure closed mold method employing gas pressure low pressure and pultrusion and there is filament winding so we will see each of them briefly one by one now okay so first technique is contact molding method it is the simplest oldest and most commonly used method okay so it uses open ended mold for making frps so by open ended mold we mean a flat surface a cavity and a positive plug okay in this generally a catalytic agent is used to initiate the chemical reaction in resin to cause hardening and before pouring fibers and resin inside the mold wax polishing and gel coating is done on the mold so that the prepared composite can be extracted easily it has proper luster and it has smooth finishing okay so these are some basic properties or points to remember about contact molding now in contact molding there can be two types of methods first is hand lay up method so in this as shown in the image okay fiber preform is placed on the polished flat surface of the mold okay then resin material with catalytic agent is poured or applied using the brush on the fiber preform and finally roller is used to force the resin into the fabrics into the fibers to ensure enhanced interaction okay so these are the three steps that are used in hand lay up method and these steps will be repeated again and again to increase the layer or increase the thickness of composite okay and the second method is the spray up method uh, this method uses a hand gun to spray resins and in this chopped uh, so in this both 
resin and fibers are poured using the spray gun since resin is liquid material and fiber is a solid material so basically since we are spraying so here chopped fiber are used mostly okay so in the image you can see a spray gun and two pipes attached to it okay so one is for resin and the other is for fiber okay here the fibers that are used shall be fine since they are sprayed as i told earlier and simultaneously uh, a roller is used to fuse these fibers into the matrix material okay since it is an automatic process it is a it is faster than the hand layup method okay so in contact molding though is widely used it has its own advantages and limitations what are these advantages and limitations so when we talk about advantages of contact molding it provides the design flexibility since the layering is uh, like we can control the layering it uh, large and complex items can be manufactured the startup time and cost are minimum here semi skilled workers can, uh, can fulfill the requirement for us in in this mold in inserts are possible suppose during the fabrication of composite i want to provide some insert so i can easily provide the insert in between my layers also since i am controlling the manufacturing of each layer i can provide inserts in between also and in this sandwich construction is possible so i will construct one layer then i will construct another layer so suppose i want to change the orientation of fiber in both the layers that i can do i can place the my fiber preform in different orientation and i can stack it up for making my desired laminate okay now what are the disadvantages of this method it is a low volume process so it won't be able to manufacture a large volume of composite low reinforcement content generally the laminates that are made using this method has low reinforcement content difficult in removing all air voids since we are using a mechanical roller to remove the air voids some sometimes all the air voids may not be removed properly okay quality may not be uniform and there may be unevenness since the lower roller is a mechanical pressure that we are applying sometimes it may be high sometimes it may be low so it depends upon the person who is handling the lower also uh, uh, the roller also okay so quality may not be uniform and there can be unevenness it is labor intensive since it requires lab labor work and there is chances that it will relate to high waste okay so these are some of the advantages and disadvantages of contact molding the second broad category of frp manufacturing is compression molding method so as the name suggests it involves pressing or squeezing of deformable material charge between two halves of heated mold or feed material and subsequent transformation into the into a molded part after cooling or curing okay so in this compression is used as a force to infuse both fiber and matrix into a composite okay Tip, uh, the instrument typically involves a large tonnage press or and heated dies for uh, compressing the feed material okay now within compression molding there are different method the first is mash die method so in this the feed material that is the mixture of fiber and resin goes into the counter of the mold at high temperature the mold surfaces are then squeezed and which makes the feed material to take desired shape and then it is cured rapidly so the feed material here can be of two types it can be sheet molded compound where sheet of premixed fiber resin and fiber blend with all the additives are used and it can uh, the feed material can also be a dough molded compound where a blend of short fibers and resin mixture having a consistency like dough is used so in the image both types of uh, uh, match dye molding can be seen so in the first image it shows a dough molded feed it was placed between two molds and the molds were uh, then squeezed okay which helped me help my feed material to take uh, take desired shape of frp composite okay and in the second image shows the heated sheet uh, feed between uh, a heated sheet uh, sheet mold uh, uh, a heated sheet type feed material was used and it was pressed between the two molds 
and finally the molded part took the desired shape of composite okay so here you can see this was the first method and this is the second method sheet was used and it was pressed between the molds okay since the sheet was heated it was workable and after pressing it uh, to the desired shape it will be cured so that it won't deform again okay now the second category is forming method employing gas pressure so in this gas pressure is used for forming the feed material into desired shape as the name suggests okay this can be done in several ways either through open molds or closed molds so in closed mold uh, face molds there is pressure thermo for forming okay so uh, in pressure thermo forming uh, the heated feed material is placed uh, above the mold okay with the o ring see uh, seals that are attached on the side okay at the top a squeeze plate is placed having a blow air pipes in between okay then gas pressure through the top plate is used to compress the feed material so from here i will come here and when the gas pressure is employed my feed material will compress in the mold uh, and it will take the desired shape while my gas will be released to the vent or the vacuum at the base and this will make my feed material to take the desired shape okay another way can be high pressure gas forming here the method is the same there is this feed material and there are two heated filaments okay one at the top and one at the bottom when feed material is placed between them it softens okay so it will so soften it and it will loosen up okay now here the gas pressure is passed instead from top here it is passed from the sides so when the gas is passed the feed material will be compressed to the faces of the filament and it will take the desired shape once it has taken the desired shape the molds are open and the feed material is cooled and we will finally get the desired shape of our laminate okay so these method were closed mold forming method so employing gas pressure now another way can be in open face molds so the basic concept here is to place the heated feed material on the top of the mold and then covering the feed material from the top with a plastic bag which is sealed from the sides and at last sucking the air inside the plastic bag in which the feed material is placed uh, such that my feed material will pressurize on the into the desired mold shape okay so in the images we can see all three such assemblies one is the vacuum bag molding so in which i had the mold mold face at the base here i placed my uh, feed material heated feed material i covered it from the top with the bag and through uh, a port uh, air port i sucked the air out of my uh, back cover and this helped my feed material to take the desired shape of the mold okay second method was autoclave molding in this again uh, mold was there feed material was there which was covered from the top with a bag and my uh, gas pressure is employed to compress this bag at the top of the mold instead of sucking the air out from the beneath the mold here the gas pressure was applied to pressurize the bag on the mold due to which my feed material will take the desired shape here again the same method is used pressure bag molding in which again the gas pressure was used to compress my feed material over the open mold okay so these are all forming method employing gas pressure okay the third category within compression molding is closed mold method employing low gas uh, low gas pressure so this consists of placing the reinforcement in a closed mold and then inserting the raising material into the mold to infiltrate the reinforcement via low pressure injection okay this again can be done by various assemblies like uh, in vacuum assisted raising injection uh, what is then raising is added into the mold containing the fibers and vacuum cavities are used to suck the air out to create a pressurized compression okay so this is vacuum assisted raise in the injection so we had this mold okay 
my reinforcement or my fibers are placed here and my resin was injected to through this hole and from the side vacuum was created such that all my air will be sucked out and this will compress and it will take the form of a laminate so this is vacuum assisted resin in injection molding uh, second is resin transfer molding here resin like epoxy resin and hardener is injected into the closed mold containing fiber via low pressure injection and once uh, my mold uh, fiber and matrix uh, completely mixes with each other it will take the shape of my desired laminate okay and the most famous among the closed mold method employing gas pressure is transfer molding or reinforced resin in injection molding so in this there is a transfer pot in which the feed material like a dough of fiber and resin is placed okay uh, this is known as charge okay now this charge is pressed using a plunger from the top and the plunger is heated as the plunger will be heated my charge uh, will start to flow through the sp uh, sprue pipe that is here and it will uh, it will go into the mold cavity where it will be allowed to cool and take the allowed to take the desired shape of my frp okay so this is known as transfer molding or reinforced resin injection molding okay again here we employed low uh, low pressure we create uh, applied pressure from the top and we heated the filament which help us to take the desired shape of the mold okay so these all were compression molding methods one more method in compression molding is pultrusion for forming so this is a very famous method in compression molding so th this involves a process the process here involves uh, strands of continuous fiber pulled through a resin bar which are further consolidated in a heated bag okay here rather than applying pressure the product is pulled uh, from the die to take the desired shape okay it is a continuous process useful for fabrication of composite with a constant cross section uh, with a relatively longer length and it enables production with a high degree of automation and low production cost okay so this this is the major advantage of pultrusion forming and using pultrusion forming different types of profiles such as rod tubes and various structural shapes can be fabricated very easily so you can see in the image the same process can be seen easily so initially i have my fibers okay unidirectional glass roving so these fibers are through multiple directional met uh, they are made to pass through the resin okay so this is a thermoset resin through which my fibers are passed okay after passing my fibers through resin they are passed through an heated die so that my fiber and resin can blend together into a composite then the blended composite is pulled out of the heated die and it is cutted using a saw cutter into the desired shape and it will give me my desired profile of frp it can be rod it can be tube or it can be any structural shape and since this whole process is automated it will be used for large scale production of frp composites okay now the third broad category of frp manufacturing is filament winding method so it is a continuous process that offers self automation which leads to reduced cost in this my fibers are driven by several pulleys through continuous prepack sheets rovings and monofilaments are made here continuous sheets and monofilaments are made to may, are made to pass through resin bath and they are collected over a rotating mandrel then after applying sufficient layer mandrel which has desired shape of the product it is set for curing at room temperature okay once my mandrel has sufficient layers of uh, frp composite i will uh, stop the process and i will cure the mandrel okay and this is used for making tank air bottles helicopter blades and pipes so these are some of the major application where filament winding method is used so you will see this method is very similar similar to pultrusion forming method but the type of composite we are preparing using this method is different so the same uh, process of filament winding can be seen in the image also so this is a continuous roving system from here my fibers are pulled they are made to pass through a resin bath after raising path through a moving carriage they are collected over a rotating mandrel 
okay and the same thing is shown here continuous rovings okay it is made to pass through a resin bath then through nip roller if i want to compress my fiber in the resin composite i can compress and then using a guider i will collect my frp over a rotating mantle okay so these are different manufacturing uh, processes that are opted for making a frp any doubts in these manufacturing processes that we can discuss okay so this is a very theoretical part okay you just need to remember what are different methods what is the basic so in contact molding there is base basic if you remember the basic the process will be very clear to you then compression molding the basic is very clear and in filament winding as the name suggests the basic is very clear so just remember the basics so by that you will be able to judge if i want to manufacturing of a particular frp which technique i can opt okay let's move ahead then so now in the last slide session we discussed retrofitting of concrete structures so just to brush up the topic retrofitting is needed to enhance the performance to correct uh, strength loss due to deterioration okay to correct construction deficiencies to modify design and to enhance durability so there are different reasons for which retrofitting may be required now we already have talked about how high quality concrete and steel has been used as a retrofitting material in our last session now let's see how fiber reinforced polymers is used for retrofitting okay so the use of frp offers several advantages like it is corrosion resistance since steel is not used here so such uh, repair material can be critical in marine environment frp is lightweight and which can be critical for aerospace engineering it is it has high strength to weight ratio which can be critical for retrofitting in high rise buildings and several other benefits like it has high strength and stiffness it is durable and it uh, and the easy fabrication of frp okay now frp as a retrofitting material is used in several ways like it can be used as plates and strips okay the plates and strips can be attached on the tension face to improve the flexural capacity it can be used as as bars as reinforcement in concrete instead of steel or as a near surface uh, mounting uh, uh, repair method it can be used as cables at as tendons in uh, post tension members in bridge girders and it can be used as a wrapping material around columns as a confinement to enhance the compressive strength and ductility okay in the image also we can see a uh, few of such examples like here we can see frp bars are used here frp wrapping has been done on the column here frp sheets are used in the flexural zone here the roof was created using frp since it is lightweight here frp cables was used in bridge in offshore platforms also frp was used in chimneys also frp was used and for manufacturing tank also frp was used okay now since a structure may become critical for different reason okay so a strengthening of structure is generally classified into uh, three categories that we already know it can be flexural strengthening shear strengthening and axial strengthening so let's see how frp is used in each of these categories now okay so when we talk about use of frp for flexural strengthening it is generally achieved in two ways either by bonding frp sheet strip or laminate on the tension face with fiber oriented along the length of the member or by bonding frp rebars on the tension plate via near surface mounting along the length of the reinforcement so using both of these ways we can uh, cover the flexural strengthening using frp now how does this strengthening happen with the frp so we can see suppose i have a rc beam with a total depth b effective depth small d and width b okay it is subjected to some external load from the top okay such that 
above neutral axis there is compression zone and below neutral axis there is tension zone so since my uh, the portion below neutral axis is in tension we provide reinforcement in the tension zone and then additionally we are providing frp plate at the base also so in strain diagram we can see now apart from the strain in the top compression fiber in the top compression phase and the strain in the rebar phase there is a additional strain taken by frp also okay and in the stress diagram also we can see the total compressive force will be balanced by both the tensile strength of the reinforcement and the tensile strength of the frp since my frp is providing an additional allowance of uh, of balancing the compressive force it will allow our uh, reinforced concrete to take more load and it will thus strengthen the structure so this is the basic behind how flexural strengthening is accompanied using is accomplished using frp okay now there can be several factor which dictate the flexural strengthening via frp what are these factors amount of fiber frp composites so higher the amount of frp composite i am using more will be the strengthening but lower will be the ductility so like this my stress strain curve it will improve but my ductility my ultimate strain before failure it will reduce as the amount of frp composite will increase orientation of fiber in frp so this we already know the increase in strength is maximum when the fiber is oriented along the length of the member and it will be minimum when the fiber is oriented along the perpendicular direction type of fiber so the amount of uh, strengthening in flexural uh, amount of flexural strengthening can differ based on the type of fiber also our frp can be glass fiber reinforced polymer it can be aramid fiber reinforced polymer it can be carbon fiber reinforced polymer and for each case my strengthening level will be different and finally one more major factor which governs the flexural strengthening is the bonding between frp and concrete so better is the bonding higher is the performance okay we will see each of these factor how they affect the strengthening uh, ahead also okay this is just for the basic like basic conclusion about how different factors are affecting now apart from uh, the factors that are affecting flexural strengthening additionally the pattern of cracking in concrete structure in uh, with frp also plays an important role in understanding the performance like there can be either debonding or peeling of frp which shows that neither frp nor concrete failed it was the bond between frp and concrete that was that failed there can be rupture of frp which shows that frp was able to provide sufficient strength and concrete was didn't fail it was the frp that failed there can be steel yielding okay this shows that frp didn't fail it was the steel that yielded that yielded which led to the cracking in concrete and there can be crushing in concrete which again shows that it was the weakness of concrete that lead to failure while my frp in bonding was sufficient okay so based on the type of failure also we can identify what factor dictated the flexural strengthening of my frp okay since this frp function is clear to us and how it is used we can draw a similar analogy from the discussion that we had uh, of for strengthening using steel in last session like attaching plate and uh, uh, using some adhesive material to attach plate or providing some anchoring everything will be the same like steel today let's see some literatures or we can see some research publication which have done uh, which have been done to address how different factor dictates the frp strengthening so going through some of these literature it will provide you better clarity of how these factors that we have uh, discussed right now how they are affecting the strengthening for ability of frp and how we see the failures in each of them okay so let's see some of those articles one by one so this is the first article that was published in 1991 by one of the authors ricci so the aim of this article was to demonstrate the increase in flexural capacity of a beam with frp so what this author did he took a beam okay of certain dimension at the base of the beam he attached a frp laminate okay and he applied the load from the top so he took two cases 
a control beam where there was no FRP attached and a uh, beam where FRP was attached. And what he did by application of load, he measured the moment on the mid span so as the load is increasing the mid span moment is including increasing and he measured the deflection uh, mid span moment was the deflection so you can see in case of control beam it was not able to take a higher amount of moment and there was a lot of deflection even before 300 kN moment reached okay however when frp was used as an external sheet for strengthening in flexion direction, you can see my the same beam was able to take more, it was able to resist more moment while it was giving a very less amount of deflection. So it shows how FRP is able to increase the moment carrying capacity of beam in flexion and how it is re resisting the deflection also. Okay. And Apart from this moment versus deflection, the author also talked about different failure method. So here you can see my bonding was peeled off in one case. In one case, there was failure in FRP and in one case, there was the end failure that occurred in FRP. So author talked about different cases where from where what can happen. So in this B type, you can see concrete crushing happened. So based on the level of adhesion and the strength of concrete and the quality of fiber, certain types of failures can be obtained. Now this next article was published in 1992 by these two authors and they studied different amount of FRP strengthening. Okay, so what they did, they used carbon fiber reinforced polymer of a certain tensile strength and Young's modulus and they changed the thickness. Okay, so I have this beam. Okay, here I am attaching my FRP sheet. So they attach suppose one sheet, two sheet, three sheet and four sheet. So if I am attaching more sheets, so I am increasing the thickness of my FRP composite that I am attaching. So they did that only. So in one case they attach 2M, 0.2 mm thick FRP sheet and in another case they attach 0.6 mm FRP sheet, then 0.9 mm and then 1.9 mm. And for each of them, they applied the load on the beam and they checked the deflection the mid span deflection happening in the beam so you can see in the and uh, in, uh, in the beam where there was no frp it was not able to take much load and there was a lot of strain at a very low value of load while as the amount of uh, ca uh, the frp thickness as the frp thickness was increasing from 0.9 to uh, this value okay the load carrying capacity of the beam also increased. So you can see now from this value below 10, load carrying capacity increased up to near 40 kN. Okay. And in the graph, they, they reported several types of failure also. So in case of low pers lower thickness of FRP, there was FRP rupture, which shows my FRP failed. While in higher percentage, higher thickness of FRP sheet, there was debonding failure. So it shows my FRP didn't fail, but the bond between FRP and concrete failed. Okay. So in this image, the, the diagram is uh, shown like what I draw. And this was their final conclusion of what was the influence of FRC on failure mechanism. So as there is increase in the amount of uh, uh, FRP thickness, my failure mechanism changes from steel yielding to steel concrete crushing to compression failure. Okay, from FRP play failure, I go to concrete failure. Okay, as my amount of FR FRP is increasing. Okay, by increasing the thickness, it is same like increasing the amount of FRP only. Okay, now this is the third article which was published in 1996. Uh, the aim of this article was to study different amount of FRB strengthening. So again, like we saw in the last uh, article, again, they used CFRP as a, uh, for, as a sheet, CFRP sheet they used, and they used CFRP in different layers. So zero layer, one layer, two layer, and three layer they placed. Okay, so this was their beam design. So it was a simply supported beam. Okay, and they placed a CFRP sheet at the bottom. Okay. There was one case where there was no CFRP and there was these three cases with different amount of CFRP sheets. 
okay and they applied moment okay and they observed the mid span deflection so you can see again uh, in the case where there was no frp attached at the base there the beam was not able to take much uh, I, the beam was not able to resist higher amount of moment and it showed a very large deflection also okay till here you can see deflection happened up till 45 mm however as the fr cfrp layer was increasing the moment carrying capacity of the beam increased and the deflection in the beam decreased so as we said earlier when we uh, 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 when we were talking about different factors affecting my frp uh, flexor strength so as the amount of frp is increasing my strength carry the strength strengthening of structure is increasing while the ductility is decreasing since my strain at failure is decreasing okay so in this table also you can see as my frp uh, layers are increasing the ultimate load carrying capacity of the structure increase and in this section it shows what was the mode of failure so in case of under reinforced beam without frp concrete crushing happened in case of as uh, one layer cfrp concrete crushing happened uh, along with splitting of cfrp sheet so cfrp also failed in case of three layers of cfrp concrete crushing happened splitting of cfrp happened and there was some minimum debonding also while in case of five layers there was concrete crushing uh, and debonding along with some uh, cfrp splitting also okay so this was different types of failures that we that they found based on different layers of cfrp attached now there was a more study done in 1994 and here they talked about different types of frp so they used amide fiber reinforced polymer composite they used glass fiber and they used carbon fiber so again the setup was the same a beam and at the base frp was attached so they used different uh, configuration they used a beam with one rebar they used a beam having two reinforcement and these both were without frp and they used third configuration where there was one reinforcement inside and an frp sheet attached at the base okay so you can see in the first diagram it is showing what is the property the stress strain behavior of different types of fiber so you can see my aramid fiber it has the maximum stress and strain limit while my e glass is more is the my while my graphite uh, uh carbon fiber uh, is the most stiffer and my glass fiber lies in between okay and once these fibers are used as a composite uh, this figure shows how was the dis displacement at the mid span changing by with the application of load so in case of control beam uh, it was not able to take much load and it was showing a large amount of deflection also while when the beam was a uh, single uh, rebar beam was enforced with the uh, frp sheets it, it was able to take much higher amount of load okay along with minimum deflection and such loading time was observed to be similar to a beam with two reinforcement so you can say a beam with one reinforcement and an frc frp sheet can perform equivalent to a beam with two reinforcement <coughs> and they also reported different failure modes okay so for control beam they observed that concrete crushing happened in case of aramid fiber reinforced polymer uh, crushing along with debonding was observed in case of glass fiber reinforced polymer they observed that fiber uh, tension failure was observed at the bottom and in case of carbon fiber they again observed fabric tension failure at the bottom uh once once again this article was published in 19 uh, one more article was published in 1997 and they aim to study different orientation of fiber and epoxy resin so what they did they chose a uh, cfrp fiber and they changed the orientation of fiber 0 degree 45 degree and 90 degree and they used two epoxy commercially available and rubber toughened epoxy okay so in this image you can see four orientations of frp this is 0 degree this is 90 degree and this is 45 degree okay and these are just near the ends when i apply my frp sheets and this was the 
beam layout design so it was a simply supported beam and at the base a uh, frp sheet was attached so based on the result they observed that in longitudinal direction my when my fibers are oriented in longitudinal direction it was able to take a much higher stress and showed the minimum deflection while my when my uh, fibers were or angled like 45 degree or 90 degree it was not able to take as much load as it was able to take in the longitudinal fibers so this was clear to us from the last live session also that when the fibers are rotated along the length of the member it is it has the maximum tensile property okay and furthermore this table shows the result so for first epoxy type a for different fiber uh, orientation what was my tensile strength so you can see in zero degree when my fiber orientation was along the length, my tensile strength was maximum. And for epoxy B, B also, that along zero degree, my tensile strength was maximum. And between A and B, my tensile strength was higher for when I am using epoxy B. Okay. So this shows that combination of uh, fiber along the length of the rebar with epoxy b type epoxy that is rubber toughened epoxy provides a much higher tensile strength compared to all other cases okay and this was a literature that was published in 2019 a very recent literature which did a critical review of frp strengthening so what they took they took a frp beam simply supported beam and they showed that there can be three methods of frp reinforcement frp strengthening it can be through plates or sheets complete coverage or in between coverage or it can be through nsm bars also near surface mounting bars also and they compared different types of frp is it steel so you can see as compared to steel cfrp gives the maximum uh, stress limit however it is most st more stiffer while my afrp and gfrp they give a lower stress limit however they are more ductile compared to cfrp and they also talked about different types of failures here you can see the frp failure happened due to rupture there was frp debonding here and there was cover uh, concrete cover separation due to failure mode okay so they talked about various types of failure modes also which can occur in frp strengthening okay so i hope everyone are clear with this discussion part of flexible strengthening using frp so we talked about uh, how frp is used in flexible strengthening why it uh, does flexible strengthening Several factors on which uh, the amount of flexural strengthening depends using FRP. For each of these factors, we saw a lot of literatures. What uh, what literatures have shown? Uh, how literatures have done? Have studied different variations and what results they observed. And we saw different kinds of failure also. In what case, what type of failure is observed? Any doubt in this part? Flexural strengthening part. Uh, so if no doubt we'll move ahead so now let's talk about shear strengthening using frp so this is generally achieved by wrapping a frp sheet or a fabric on the member on the side either partially or completely and orienting the fibers in the trans uh, transverse to the axis of the member or perpendicular to the shear crack potential shear crack direction now so in the image you can draw basic understanding of how shear strengthening happens so if we consider a beam cross section uh, under the action of a compressive load from the top okay such that uh, there, uh, uh, there can, there will be bending in the beam. Okay, so my compression, uh, compressive force will be maximum at the top. Okay, when I am talking about a nor normal stresses, it will vary linearly. My compressive force will be maximum at the top, while my tensile force will be maximum at the bottom, and it will be minimum at the center. Now, and corresponding to this, the shear stress will be minimum at the corner and maximum at the center. So, for a particular shear force Vp, 
acting on a beam the shear is resisted by both concrete and steel that we can understand from the basic of reinforced concrete design of IS456 also. So VC is the amount of shear force that will be taken by concrete and it depends upon the grade of concrete and the dimensions while VS is the amount of shear force that will be resisted by the steel and it again depends upon the grade of steel and the cross-sectional area of steel. Having a FRP wrapped around the concrete, it will provide additional steer reinforcement by an amount V FRP. And this additional amount thus increases the shear capacity, shear resistance capacity of the concrete in total. Okay, so from this basic formula, you can understand what my FRP is doing. It is increasing the shear resistance capacity of my member. Okay. Now, there are several factors which dictates the shear strengthening by FRP, like amount of FRP wrapping. So, it can be either partial or complete. More is the wrapping, higher is the shear strength gain. Okay, orientation of fibers in FRP. So, the increase in strengthening in shear is maximum when the fibers are transfers to the excess of the member or perpendicular to the potential shear crack. Okay, type of FRP, it can be GFRP, AFRP or CFRP. For each type, my shear strengthening limit can be different. And again, bonding between FRP and concrete. So better is the bonding, better is the load transfer between the existing structure and the FRP and higher is the performance. Okay. In addition to these factors, the pattern of cracking of concrete structure with the FRP also plays an important role in understanding the performance. So there can be diagonal shear crack in concrete. There can be perpendicular shear crack at the base. There can be rupture of FRP, debonding of FRP or crushing of concrete. So based on the type of damage, we can be we will be able to quantify what, what factor is governing the failure. Whether my amount of FRP was lower, that, that is why the rupture in FRP happened. It was not able to take load. Or if my orientation of fibers are not proper, then rupture of FRP can happen. If my bonding between FRP and concrete is weak, then debonding can happen. Or if my FRP is of very good quality, then I will observe crushing in concrete and shear cracks in concrete as my failure. It will delay the time for crushing in concrete and shear, shear cracking in concrete if my FRP is of desired quality. Okay, since this FRP function again for shear strengthening is clear to us and how it can be used, we can draw analogy from the last session. Let's see several literatures again that have been carried out to address different factors that dictates the FRP's uh, effect on shear strengthening. So this was one literature that was published in 1998 and their aim was to demonstrate different FRP shear reinforcement configurations. So what they did, they talked about in different how in different ways FRP can be used for shear shear for shear strengthening. So FRP uh, can be wrapped on the sides, or it can be completely covered cover a beam from the base and the side. So this will be both flexure plus shear strengthening. This is shear strengthening, or I can wrap my beam from all top and bottom. So this again is a a configuration for flexure and shear strengthening. Now my FRP orientation can change. It can be 90 degree. Okay. It can be 45 degree. It can be mix of 90 and 45 and it is covering the whole. It is covering only a certain portion from the corner or it can be in the form of strips also. So in this way the type of FRP scheme can change. Okay, anchoraging can be done. Either I don't need any anchorage to attach my FRP to the uh, existing structure. I just need a uh, resin glue here. Or additionally, I can do some anchoraging also to strengthen my bond between my FRP and the existing structure. And my fiber orientation, as I talked here, can also change. It can be 90 degree or 0 degree or 45 degree or even combination of them. So in this way, Several con uh, configurations can be opted for shear reinforcement that was talked in this literature. Then there was one more article published by Tang and Chain in 2007 and their aim was to demonstrate different FRP shear reinforcement configuration again. They talked about configuration. So they talked that FRP orientation in 90 degree and how it can be placed on sides, U-shape and completely covering 
then they talked about in between like angled uh, frp uh, strips also again on sides u shaped and completely covered and they t- talked about both direction of wrapping also for all the three schemes and they again talked about 90 degree 45 degree and cross uh, uh, degrees and how different configuration can be drawn from each of the methods so this is what they talked mainly okay there was one more article that was published in 2000 okay which was which aimed to demonstrate different frp shear reinforcement configuration okay so like the earlier two article here also reinforcement con- configuration was talked about so they had four cases a control beam a flexure only shear only and shear flexure so flexure only is like from the bottom okay shear only is on the side and shear flexure only is like u type okay for each type they used cfrp okay and glass fiber in some cases okay they know knew the property of concrete steel glass fiber and carbon fiber and this was their beam arrangement and they checked how with applied load deflection is varying in case of each each uh, beam so you can see as compared to control beam the maximum load carrying capacity was increasing so in case of flexure my deflection was uh, like my load carrying capacity was higher as compared to my uh beam where only shear shear only frp was provided so you can see, we know that flexure uh, when i am doing frp on the fla- on the base on the bottom it will be able to take more flexure load rather than on the side and thus it can be seen from here also okay one more article was published in 2000 which demonstrated different frp shear reinforcement configurations okay so they tested all the beams uh, uh, for different configuration they tested the beams so they observed that the control beam was giving diagonal tension failure the flexure only beam okay the same article oh, sorry the same article also checked for failure pattern also so they saw that in the control beam there was diagonal tension failure in flexure only beam there was debonding at the supports that they observed okay in shear only beam they observed that yielding of tension reinforcement was happening while in shear and flexure only beam there was crushing in concrete and compression that led to failure okay so this these both slide were uh, for the same paper uh kev and macri in 2000 they demonstrated different frp configuration so for that they saw how the load versus deflection profile is changing and how for each case the de- failure pattern is changing now uh, this was an article in 2001 which dem- demonstrated different shear strengthening so what they did they used different uh, frp strengthening setup okay here uh, uh, frp was played at the base here it was played uh, placed at the base also and a little portion on the sides also here a uh, frp sheet was placed at the base also and on the sides also up till uh, central depth here here a frp was placed at the base and a wrap was done on the sides also complete wrapping on the side up till central depth and here up on the full sides the frp wrapping was done okay and for each case they applied load at the top and they measured the central deflection so you can see from this load versus deflection profile in case of beam e it was able to take maximum load since frp from the side was wrapping it was confining the beam which was increasing the load capacity and at the base also there was a frp strip which was increasing the load capacity while at a there was maximum deflection but a lower amount of load so if we see from a ductility point of view my beam a setup is better however if we see from the maximum load carrying capacity point of view my beam e is more superior most superior and they showed the different failures pattern also so in beam a the failure was concrete failure and debonding in beam b also there was frp failure here again concrete spalling occurred in uh, d- beam d there was concrete crushing at the top and here also there was concrete crushing at the top which led to failure initiation okay this was an article published in 
where where they demonstrated the effect of strip width and spacing so we talked initially right the my strip it can be a complete wrapping or a partial wrapping so in strips also i can place on the side for shear strengthening so what they did they talked about this width and what is the spacing between the two strips so they had two series with and without steel stirrups inside and they had chose different width to spacing ratio of 45 40 to 115 87.5 to 175 53 upon 87.5 30 upon 50 87.5 upon 125 and 1 is to 1 so different ratios of uh, width of strip and spacing they chose and for a simple continuous beam design this was the setup of how they attached the strips on the sides okay and they applied the load and they check the deflection and under load so you can see for different configuration they were able able to obtain different loading pattern and the maximum load was taken in the case where my distance between the strip was minimum and the width of the strip was maximum okay so in that case the maximum load carrying capacity was observed okay so that case is this this one you can see here the black one it has the maximum load carrying capacity and it would have had minimum spacing between the strips and maximum width of the strip okay here uh, one more article is shown that was published in 2003 that was that aimed to demonstrate the demanding of frp so what they did they talked about two types of frp uh, schemes in one the frp was placed on the sides only and in one the frp was placed like a u jacketing so they talked about the these different scheme and the different thickness of frp also and you can see as the thickness of frp is increasing the load carrying capacity increase and in case of u jacketing there was maximum load carrying capacity okay and they also tagged uh, talked about fiber orientation and how failure modes change when my frp is side bonded and how when failure mode happens when my frp is u jacketed okay so this was all about shear strengthening using frp so here we talked initially how shear strengthening is done using frp by wrapping frp strips or sheets on the side why shear strengthening happens because because frp offers an additional shear resisting force which increasing the shear strength of the of the existing infrastructure we talked about several factors which dictate shear strengthening amount of fiber orientation type and bonding and what are the different types of failure we can uh, observe when a concrete structure is wrapped with frp okay then we saw several literature with which demonstrated configuration uh Uh, different level of shear strengthening, different strip uh, width and spacing effect, and different type of bonding and debonding. Okay, any doubts in shear strengthening portion? If you know the basic, it is very simple to understand. Okay, just go through the uh, this lecture slide again or the YouTube recording again. Uh, maybe if my speed is a little fast, you can. Play it on point five or point seven five, and you will be able to understand everything. So in each slide, I have tried to summarize one paper very, ah, uh, like precisely, so that you can just see the main crux of those paper and understand what was the basic idea and what was the end result. Okay. Any doubts in shear strengthening part? Okay, so since there are no doubt, we'll move to the last topic for today. That is axial strengthening using FRP. So by using FRP composite, axial strengthening in concrete can be achieved by wrapping the FRP strips or plates on the columns. So basically, when we are talking about axial strengthening, it is for columns. Okay. so we it can be achieved by wrapping frp strips or plate on the columns on the sides either partially or completely or intermittently and it is done to enhance the ductility and load bearing capacity of column 
सो इफ वी सी ए कॉन्क्रीट कॉलम डिजाइन एज पर आई एस फोर फाइव सिक्स डिजाइन गाइडलाइन सो फॉर एन एक्जियल लोड एक्टिंग ऑन अ कॉलम फ्रॉम द टॉप द कॉलम इज री इज री इनफोर्स विद लॉन्गिट्यूडनल री इनफोर्समेंट ऑन द साइड टू रजिस्ट द एक्जियल स्ट्रेस इन शॉर्ट कॉलम एंड इन लॉन्ग कॉलम दीज लॉन्गिट्यूडनल री इनफोर्समेंट रजिस्ट द एक्जियल स्ट्रेस ऑल्सो एंड द बकलिंग ऑल्सो ओके नाउ when my frp is wrapped around the column what happens my frp provides additional confinement strength, strength to the column which in turn helps us to resist the lateral stress that is generated by the load acting on the top okay thus by the use of frp we can increasing we can increase the maximum load carrying capacity okay so you can see in this formula this formula you may recall from is 456 uh, design so pu that is the ag maximum axial load carrying capacity of a column it is dependent upon the area of concrete and the grade of concrete plus my area of steel in compression that is my longitudinal reinforcement times the grade of longitudinal reinforcement and by addition of frp it provides an additional uh strengthening to the concrete which can increase increase the axial load carrying capacity of my concrete okay so in the figure also you can see the same has been shown so like for unconfined column okay the stress increases up to a certain limit and then it drops however with frp the stress taken by the column continues to increase beyond the limit of un unconfined concrete okay so this is due to this additional factor that is coming to increasing increase the pu the ultimate load carrying capacity of the column now again several factors can dictate the say axial strengthening of frp like amount of frp confinement so more is the confinement higher is the axial strength and lower is the ductility of column orientation of fiber so the increase in strength is maximum when the fiber is oriented along the length of the column slenderness ratio of columns so you will see confinement is more effective in short column rather than in slender column type of confinement based on the type of material that we are choosing my strengthening level in axial strengthening level can change for frp and uh, based on the bonding between frp and concrete better is the bonding higher is the performance in axial strengthening and the type of cross, cross section so it is generally observed that the confinement is more effective in circular column rather than rectangular column what is the reason we will see later on in one of the literature and additionally the pattern of cracking of concrete with the frp also plays an important role in, in understanding the performance so there can be lap failure that is the failure in the wrap material okay frp wrapping there can be concrete failure there can be rupture of frp there can be debonding of frp and there can be buckling of steel so you will see each of these failure in different cases in the literature side right? okay now since we know the basic of frp and how axial strengthening is done in columns similar to how we talk with steel so let's just see the literatures of how they have demonstrated different factors dictating this effect of frp on strengthening so this is first literature that was published in 2002 where they demos they where they were their aim was to demonstrate the effect of confinement level so they talked about they chose if a glass fiber reinforced polymer of 0.4 mm thick and they uh, did the confinement in different layers so they used uh, first case was zero okay without any frp one layer of frp two layer of frp four layer and eight layer so as I, as i will increase the layers i will increase the thickness of confinement okay and the fiber orientation was along zero degree so they applied axial strain on the column and they measured the axial they applied axial stress and they measured the axial strain on the column so you can see as the number of layers is increasing my axial stress is increasing so suppose at a particular axial stress you can see as the number of layer is increasing there is lower a uh, strain in the column and it uh, up to failure my eight layers is able to take the maximum stress however and it is also showing a considerable amount of strain okay so as the my confinement level was increasing my both stress and strain limit were increasing for fiber okay and this is the figure which is showing how 
with the increasing axial stress the lateral strain was varying so the, in this direction okay so if i have this column and my axial stress is acting so in this direction i talk about axial strain okay and in this direction i will talk about lateral strain okay so here you can see as the axial stress as the thickness of frp sheet is increasing okay my axial strain limits are decreasing up till 6.1.6 mm, 6 .1 .6 mm uh, frp uh, confinement and for 3.2 it again increased okay uh, and the stress ultimate stress bearing capacity increased as the confinement level increased okay and then this images they show what was the type of failure so you can see in one uh, layer frp there was lab failure that was observed okay demonding was observed and concrete failure was observed when the wrapping was removed while in two layer and four layers of frp confinement there was fiber ruptures in frp that was that was observed to, to cause the failure okay now there was one more literature that was published in 2002 they talked about different types of confinement where they varied the type of frp cfrp afrp and jfrp they use and they use column confinement as intermediate wrapping as shown in the figure so there is a wrap then there is a gap then there is a wrap gap wrap gap so this type of uh, wrapping they opted okay they use three types of uh, FRP, GFRP, AFRP and CFRP okay and the they also varied the spacing between the wrapping so 30, 38, 40 and 50 they varied spacing in uh, 5 proportion 30, 30 mm, 38 mm, 40 mm, 50 mm and 60 mm and 78 mm so for these 6 spacing they evaluated the 3 materials for frp confinement okay and based on the result they observed that in case compared to carbon fiber glass fiber and aramid fiber you can see my carbon fiber was able to give me maximum axial stress limits okay after that there was aramid fiber and at last there was glass fiber so you can see here the limit is up to 75 somewhat here the limit is up to 65 and here the limit was is up to 95 or 100 okay and as the spacing uh, between the wrapping was increasing the ag maximum axial stress carrying capacity was decreasing in all the three cases okay in all the three cases as the spacing increased the maximum axial stress carrying capacity decreased and this was the figure that was showing how with the increase in spacing the increasing stress was decreasing and the maximum stress was observed when I used the carbon fiber reinforced polymer after that there was aramid fiber and the lowest was for glass fiber and in this figure it is showing what type of failure was observed so in glass fiber there was uh, failure in the frp here also there was failure in frp with some cracking in concrete and here also there was more amount of failure in frp was observed with the a little cracking in concrete okay and this paper one more paper in 1995 they demonstrated different types of frp confinement scheme so they varied wrapping in nine different orientations so there was hoop splits uh, uh, so this shows different wrapping schemes okay so in uh, along the length of the column if my fiber is oriented in one layer two layer and three layer so zero degree zero two zero three and zero four so along the length of the column if my fibers are orienting then how my strengthening will change and how with the increase in layers of fiber my strengthening will change so this was these four cases in the fifth case, if my fibers was oriented along the length and perpendicular length both. Then there was one case where there was three configuration, longitudinal oriented reinforcing layers and which between the hoop oriented layers, there was plus minus 45 degree orientation, two layers of plus minus 45 degree orientation and 9045, 45, 0 degree orientation. So for these nine configuration, they calculated how much maximum strength the 
if uh, the column was able to take and it was observed that with the four layers of FRP where fibers was oriented along the length of the column the uh, mag strength at failure was maximum okay and it was decreasing as my layers were decreasing okay when I was using 45 plus minus 45 degree orientation my stress carrying capacity was minimum okay and as i am changing my zero degree orientation to 90 degree also my stress carrying capacity was decreasing okay so here you can see all the things so maximum was with when the fibers are oriented along zero degree along the length of the uh, column and with four layers okay uh, this one more paper published in 2004, they talked about slenderness ratio. So slenderness ratio is nothing but to differ long column with short column. Okay, so they talked about 2 by L by D ratio, 3 is to 1 and 7.5 is to 1. So this is my short column and this will be my long column. Okay, so for each of these category, my FRP was wrapped on the sides. Okay, and then load was applied on the top and axial stress versus strain profile was recorded. So you can see in case of short column, my axial stress limit was higher and there was more strain limit also till failure. While for long column, my axial stress and axial strain limit was lower compared to short column. This shows that as the slenderness ratio increases, my FRP wrapping effectiveness decreases. Okay. And here also you can see the failure Okay, so lab failure was observed in short column while concrete crushing and buckling failure was observed in long column. So my FRP wrapping is more effective when my L by D ratio is lower. Okay, this paper by Mukherjee and Matra in 2004, they demonstrated the effect of cross-section type. So a column can be of different cross-section, it can be circular, it can be rectangular, it can be square. So they chose different cross-section circular square and rectangular for square and re rectangular the corner radius was 7.5 mm and they observed that when uh, frp wrapping is done and the axial load is applied so in case of circular column having same dimension my axial stress was maximum compared to square and rectangle and this shows that as the uh, for as the corner radius increases my confinement becomes more effective and my axial strength uh, uh, fiber like frp confinement is more effective and my axial load carrying capacity increases so here also you can see in the image as the corner radius increases the corner stresses decreases and as the con corner stresses decreases my confinement is more effective and thus my axial stress carrying capacity of the structure is more effective Okay, so they also plotted the effect of corner radius on confinement. So they saw as the corner radius was increasing, the uh, uh, strength was decreasing. Okay, as the corner radius was increasing, the uh, corner stress was decreasing, which was increasing the uh, effectiveness of my FRP confinement. And they also checked different failure modes. So for circular column, they observed lab failure occurred away from the mid height due to bond failure between FRP and uh, column and concrete crushing inside the FRP and for rectangular columns both square and uh, rectangle rupture of fibers at the corners away from the mid height was observed along with concrete crushing at failure location okay so this is again a very important thing the uh, the more is the corner radius the higher is the confinement by the FRP and higher is the axial load carrying capacity of the column okay so I hope everyone are clear with this axial strengthening part. Here again we saw how axial strengthening is done for columns using FRP. Why axial strengthening, why using FRP axial strengthening increases and what are the different factors on which axial strengthening depend. So apart from the common, common factors of strengthening, we here introduced two more interesting factors that was slenderness ratio of column and type of cross section. So for each of these factors, we saw literature, how they have very different uh, factors and how what result they observed and why they observed that result that we talked recently and we also saw different types of failure. 
okay in case of uh, different factors okay any doubts in this part any doubts in axial strengthening flexor strengthening and shear strengthening part so these are all like literatures these can't be like practically applied on site and check generally they are done in laboratory variations are made and then the most suitable option is applied on the field okay so in today's session we saw a lot of literature around 18 to 20 literature which have done a lot of different variation and have checked different type of force flexure shear and axial force okay any doubts in the discussion that we had today if there are no doubts we will conclude the session okay so in today's session we first saw few numericals on micromechanics of composite then we talked about different manufacturing methods of composite in which we saw contact molding compression molding and filament winding and we saw application of each type and how they are performed then we had an overview of frp strengthening and retrofitting activity why frp is used for strengthening how what factors make it more superior than steel and concrete and then we discussed several factors and failure methods that affect the choice and application of frp composite for both for all flexure strengthening shear strengthening and axial strengthening okay So that is all for today's session. Thank you. If you have any doubt, I am I will be here in the in the meet for a couple of more minutes.